John Vickers is the greatest artist Canada has ever produced. Whatever he does is done with such intensity, such integrity, and such artistry that there are very few uh, to match him. He has the complete qualities of being one of the great singing actors. Uh, one of the most uh, glorious assets that the world of art has today. Who is as telling as an actor as he is as a singer is John Vickers. I am starting to put all this muck on my face and I think, what a perfectly ridiculous way to make a living. Albert Saskatchewan. Today, one of that special group of stars in greatest demand by opera houses throughout the world. A graduate of the Royal Conservatory of Music in Toronto, his meteoric rise as an international opera singer included debuts at almost all major opera houses in little more than two years. It all began at the Royal Opera House, Covent Garden, London.
since I lived here for nearly seven years. I had two children born here, and it was really the first international city that uh, I had ever experienced. And it was the city that broadened my whole horizon as far as the arts were concerned, as far as in the broader sense of the word. Uh, Sir David Webster of this great, wonderful opera house, the Royal Opera House, Covent Garden, approached me with the idea of joining this company. I'd reached a dead end as far as Canada was concerned, and I wrestled with the idea of making this enormous leap from a virtual student of the Royal Conservative Music in Canada to a resident tenor of this great international house. In terms of my career, I, I came here as a boy and very inexperienced, very green. And here I was exposed for the first time to the great singers of the world, the great conductors of the world, uh, uh, singing with first-class orchestras and, and uh, receiving the very finest of instruction and coaching from the staff. This marvelous opera house with all of its tradition is located right smack in the middle of the great vegetable market. And it's, it's a wonderful sensation to step out of this, this world of unreality that the opera world is. And you step out onto the street with maybe a squashed tomato in the gutter and the smell of cucumbers and celery. Well, I think one of the most exciting things that ever happens in opera is when one discovers a new personality or someone that you sense from the outset has that indefinable quality called star quality. And this happened without any kind of preliminary notices coming from press blurbs or puffs. Uh, long, long ago now, in 1957, when John Vickers walked onto the stage at this opera house for the very first time, I don't think he, he, he thought of himself as someone who was going to take uh, or become what is, he is to me and to many people the greatest uh, heroic tenor of our, of our day. I was accepted by the British public. They adopted me as a way, in a way, as their son. So that really of all the opera houses in the world. This is the one that I come back to with a, a, a feeling of really coming home. No, John, I wondered if you could fall a little bit better uh, in um, a more acute angle so that you don't have so far to move up, ready to say, uh, oh, my Leonor, what's not? Uh, yeah, but I don't want, I want to say it. I don't want to say it to your face. No? No, when I fall, I start this way, oh, my Leonor. Boss, has to the meat. He can't look at her, he's so moved. Eh? Boss, has to the meat. You found me. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's just, uh, I was wa worried about this position, you know, this position of the head on the shoulder that I would like. But you do, you do this. That's all right, you, you've got uh, time to turn your body around. Me? Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah good, okay. Yeah. Uh, is that all right for you, Helga? Yeah. Good. Okay. And I think probably that, that what I would like very much is if the, if the niche can be so immediate that you don't, you don't have time to think. Of course, the thing that John Vickers brings to a role, the thing that makes him so different, so makes him so much John Vickers, is this strange ability he has uh, committing himself, absolutely, this total conviction. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I always play it that I'm so intent on the bread, I could not yeah, give it to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you see, I'm I, so concentrating I, on the bread. I feel that if, if she's here, you couldn't help but look in her eyes, you see, to well, thank her. And, and the man. Oh, no, I, I don't agree with that. Right. I, think, I think that a man in this totally dehumanized condition, and, and you know, it's. I think that he would be so dehumanized and so ashamed of his sort of condition yes, yes, that he, he, would, he would be embarrassed to look in her. And for her, it's the first... I, I, I feel that, honestly. Yes. 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 For her, he it's the see first anybody. chance to get a, a, a personal contact to him, which he wants since yes. minutes. David Ward, Helga Dinesh and I are rehearsing a scene from Beethoven's opera Fidelio. Michael Ennison is stage director and Colin Davis is conducting. The 
premiere of Fidelio is to be for a prom audience. The seats are removed to enable as many as possible to get in at a special low price. There are no reserve places. You take your chances in the lineup. For the performers, it's a marvelous audience, responsive and enthusiastic. That's important at any time, but particularly when you want your audience to respond to the, the appeal for freedom that is the essence of this great opera. Florestan, a political prisoner for two years, has been sustained by his profound love for his wife, Leonora, and his acceptance of the will of God. One of the really frustrating aspects of a, of a career as a singer is the importance of, of the voice itself. To anybody else in any other kind of a career, a cold is of no concern at all. Uh, even, the, even the beginning of a cold uh, is of no concern at all. But we can put on our makeup, we can put on our costumes, we can rehearse for four weeks, we can spend months before that preparing a role, and uh, a matter of a few days, or maybe even a day, or a matter of a few hours, really, before you're supposed to arrive on the stage, you come down with a cold, or you're coming down with a cold, and everything's lost. And it's incredible, really, when you to think that that, that everything, uh, the education of your children, uh, the your old age, your uh, your eating, and your providing for yourself in every in everything, in every aspect of life. It comes down to two little tiny things that are tucked here in the Adam's apple, in the larynx. I've listened to Fidelio in this house now for 25 years and I've seen performance after performance where the audiences have been the first act. Not unmoved, but not unduly moved, sitting quite sort of relaxed and quiet. The moment the curtain has gone up on the second act, when John Vickers has been singing and he lets out that immortal cry, Oh, Lord! The Dunkel here, he... He seems to give that sound, to impart into that sound a sort of animal-like quality, an animal-like cry of this human searching for freedom, searching for the light, the eternal cry of mankind. I've never heard it done before from any other tenor in that role, and I can't think of another tenor today who is able to give this particular part of Florestan that extra dimension of quality that John Vickers seems to have.
Bis zum Freitag! 
Very interesting for me to come back to see the house in which I was born. And uh, of course it floods one with all kinds of memories of my early childhood. There was an old well in the backyard. And there was no electricity. There was no running water in the house when I was born here. My father was a very, very strict Lutheran Presbyterian background. The piano in our home, which was was always uh, being used, was never allowed to be used on Sunday except for the playing of hymns. And it was it was an atmosphere that um, not all of us in the family uh, responded to. And there were a couple in the family who really did rebel against it. As for myself, I enjoyed it. I do feel, of course, that there has been an indelible uh, imprint on my whole personality by this upbringing. I think it has made me um, uh, be uncompromising into my demands on myself. Uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, those uncompromising demands that I make on myself, whenever I fail in my own thinking as far as being demanding of myself, I feel that I've let God down, I've let myself down, I've let my profession down, I've let uh, my talent down, and I guess that that is, 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 a, is a natural product of my upbringing. Prince Albert, Saskatchewan is a fairly typical small city of the Canadian prairies. This is where I was born, where I grew up, and where I went to school. My brothers and I spent our summers on the farm of a very close family friend. It's a very strange experience to come back to this old place. Here's where the, some of the happiest years of my life were spent not in terms of years actually but in terms of the period of my life where i was probably the most open to influence and from the years of about eight years of age last 18 every summer i came back to these this location and looking at this funny old thrashing machine brings back a lot of happy memories of getting up early in the morning and ice on the rain barrel, water had to come out of the rain barrel to 
the heat on the stove, and huge country breakfasts, and a happy, cra happy crowd of workmen around a early breakfast. Teams of horses to be harnessed, barns to be cleaned, and in the field early in the morning. And as I look back at it now, it's a, I come to the realization that it was in these years that really my whole philosophy of life was, was formed. Apart from my father, no one influenced my early life more than Frank White, my father's closest friend. Johnny never hesitated. They used to, the young people around here were very fond of having meetings. And they would, they, were all, they would all take part, you know, and they'd call on Johnny to sing well, he, he would never hesitate to sing. Although I remember one time when they accused him of, you know, showing off him a little bit. And then he said, oh, okay, he wouldn't sing. So I went to him and I said, who gave you your voice, Johnny? Well, God gave him his voice, well, then I said, sing. And he sang. And he said, he kept on singing. In those days, uh, I sang for anybody, anywhere, anytime, because it was fun then. I didn't care if my voice cracked, I didn't seem care if I sang very well or whether I didn't, I was just having fun. Churches like the First Baptist in Thunder Bay afforded the best outlet for my singing. As well, I sang at weddings and funerals and for service clubs. As now, you know, it's, 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 it's a great big stream. But before, we, we used to have a water hole that we used to be able to, you know, that we'd swim in. Well, that, and that, and that, the re other places, it was dry. To, I think the water hole was down there somewhere, wasn't it? On that next bend. On the next bend? On the, around this corner. I still have this perhaps nostalgic, uh, perhaps unrealistic yearning that, that to, to, to still be a farmer. And yeah. I'd love to have been one when I was a boy. And yeah. I suppose if financial circumstances had been different in those days, just at the end of the Depression and what with seven brothers and sisters and a father who was a school teacher, perhaps if financial circumstances had been different, I may very well have been a farmer. I used to love the hay. I used to love to pitch hay and, and be mocked because I didn't know how to use a pitchfork. And, and you made a ton of the way I was a city to, fella. You really used to fill them off with hay and then Draw your neighbors around to play in the loft. Of course, <laughs> of course. Oh, if I could get the berry girls up in the hayloft, that was that was great fun, Frank. <laughs> One of the great advantages of a world career is to be invited to sing in such historical and beautiful places as Caesarea in Israel or Epidaurus in Greece. Now here we are at Orange, in the south of France. In this 2,000-year-old Roman theater, we are rehearsing Wagner's opera Tristan and Isolde. Dr. Carl Böhm is conducting the orchestra, and in my role as Tristan, it's a great privilege to have as Isolde once again the greatest Wagnerian soprano of our time, and perhaps of all time, Birgit Nielsen. It's a very humbling experience, because even though 10,000 people come here to hear our performances, and. I hope to appreciate them, to applaud them. Standing up behind us is the statue of Caesar Augustus, 
with a reminder of the great, great civilization of Rome. walk around this exceedingly beautiful village, surrounded by the wonderful beauty of the remains of a, of a great and wonderful civilization. And sometimes it sets you wondering, what is going to be left of ours? The great Ruskin said that the history of civilization is written in three books. The book of its deeds, the book of its words, and the book of its art. And the only one that can be trusted is the book of its art. When you realize that the entire budget of the Arts Council of Canada for one year is equal to the cost of 10 miles of freeway, where is our sense of proportion? I saw more of Orange and the district of Orange. I saw more of the local culture and the atmosphere of the whole place than I have, I have seen of, of so many places that I've, I've been. There are rare occasions when a person can take on a festival atmosphere where he sings a minimum of, of, of number of performances and he can enjoy the natural atmosphere. You know, like the Bible, I said I have been waited, waiting just as long as Jacob was waiting for Rachel, you know, the Bible. He was first waiting seven uh, seven years, and then and then he got instead of Rachel, you know, they gave him the Leah, Leah, what do you call? Right. And then he had to work another seven years before he got Rachel. And I have been waiting a fourteen years too until he, <laughs> <laughs> he sang Tristan with me, but it was worth waiting for. <laughs> Tristan and Isolde is considered by many to be the greatest of all love stories. It's a tragic love in that it is based on a belief that purest love can only be achieved in death. Near the end of the opera, Tristan, dying, clings to life in a desperate hope of seeing Isolde one last time. In fact, to die with her.
You've had a, an evening of, of success or if there has been a tremendous feeling of, of unity in the performance of cooperation between conductor and designer and and your colleagues on the stage it is a very uh, exhilarating sensation you scrape off the makeup you have a shower and you walk out and you sign a few autographs or sometimes a lot of autographs and then suddenly just like that it's over and you are just a person in a big city, in a strange place, where you go home to a hotel room. A hotel room to me is a prison. It's a place that I have to go to willingly or unwillingly to preserve my energies for my work. I remove myself from society. Unfortunately, I must also remove myself from my family. The opera singer is a lonely person. And if there is one characteristic, if there is one thing that the opera singer, the international opera singer, must learn to cope with, it is his sense of personal loneliness. Jetting around the world may seem exciting, if not glamorous. Nothing could be further from the truth. It is boring, extremely tiring, and in fact, it is the greatest curse of the modern opera singer. Opera singers live surrounded by people, colleagues, audiences, in big cities and airports. But one must remain detached and alone. Social contact with colleagues is feared because it may destroy professional relationships. And social encounters generally are too demanding of the very resources we need for the stage. Opera House was founded, virtually founded, on the voice of the great Enrico Caruso. But it was only founded on that. And today it is the sum total of all the great singers from the time of Caruso, all the great producers, all the great dancers, the great actors, the great managements of this house. I feel that we are all no matter who we are as opera stars, we are all just very small segments in this great flow of 
the movement, the art. Because I believe that the stage is a moral institution. And if it is not a moral institution, then it's nothing. At this moment in the Metropolitan, I'm here seeing what I consider to be the greatest of the modern compositions of this century. An opera called Peter Grimes, written by an Englishman by the name of Benjamin Britten. Peter Grimes is the epitome of what I am trying to say. He's rejected. He's a symbol of the misunderstood man who is rejected simply because, simply because people will not take the time to understand him. I'll try and show you what I mean. Peter Grimes is a fisherman. He's a crotchety person. He's difficult to deal with. But nevertheless, society in their absolute rejection of trying to understand him, uh, they put him under such pressure that finally the poor man goes mad. Now it's very, very difficult to try to, Im to Im impart a mad scene in a vacant studio uh, on, a on a bare stage and with no orchestra. But I'm going to try to do it and I'll need your cooperation. Now to assist me, I've got Mr. Donald Foster here and uh, I'm going to ask Don if he will play two or three things to you to set the locale. First of all, I'd like him to play the screeching of the seagulls and the rolling of an ocean wave, which parts to, helps to depict some of the scene. Don? And next to that, I would like him now to play the, the, the burrow people screaming Peter Grimes at him, which of course the chorus would do off stage. This, remember, also is in Peter Grimes' mind, all right? Peter Grimes, Peter Grimes. Now, if you would play, please, the women which represent Ellen in Peter Grimes' mind, singing Peter Grimes. Grimes. All right? Now, this is tough, and it's very tough to do on a bare stage, so I'm going to need your help. Okay? Shall we try it on? <clears throat> Accidental circumstances. Water will drink my sorrows. His sorrows dry. And the tide will turn.
Peter Grimes. Here I am, hurry, 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 hurry. Now is gossip put on trial. Bring the branding iron knife. For what's done now is done for life. Come on, land me. Turn the skies back. And be has gone fishing and young Joe has gone fishing and you'll know who's gone fishing when you land the next shore Alan Alan, give me your hand, your hand. There no my hope is held by you. Take away your hand! The argument's finished! Pension lost! Thought of me shouting! Everything's said. To hell with all your mercy! To hell with your revenge! And God! Have mercy upon you! Do you hear them all shouting my name? Do you hear them? Do you hear them? Poor Davy Jones shall answer, come home, come home, come home. Peter Grimes, Peter Grimes, Peter Grimes, Peter Grimes, Peter Grimes, Peter of refuge from the operatic and from the professional life. That's why I've chosen the country, and that's why I shun the press, which is often misunderstood. To be effective in our jobs, we simply have to remove ourselves from the scene and recharge ourselves emotionally and spiritually. And this is my freedom from insanity. This is what keeps my feet on the ground, keeps my mental and spiritual balance.
my first love and my first responsibility is certainly not to my career. It is to my family. And I have consciously tried to become a, what I have called a conscious schizophrenic in that I have kept my personal life and my professional life totally separate one from the other. Because when I stand on the various stages of the world, the various operatic stages of the world, I am not being John Vickers. I am being Othello or Tristan or Aeneas or Don Jose or, Paglia or Canio in Pagliacci or Don Carlo or all the various personalities that that I have learned to become on the operatic stage. And here I find myself in the most difficult situation of all because here I am in the location of my own home. I suppose in one way I'm trying hardest here to prevent you from getting a look at me. I have five children. I have two daughters and three sons. My eldest daughter is just entering university. My eldest son is going into his second last year of school. And my youngest daughter is about eight years of age. What else can I tell you about them? I try to make them happy kids. And I am determined that as they grow up, that they think of me as nothing but their dad. I don't want them thinking of me as some kind of a celebrity, whatever that means. This farm does all kinds of things. Okay, okay. It rejuvenates okay, okay. me, it re okay. recharges me. It, it, uh, f from the standpoint of just physical exercise, I find it tremendously satisfying to come back and, and uh, throw around bales of hay, sit on a tractor and plow or disc. And even while, those, while I'm doing that kind of work, uh, I do a tremendous amount of reflecting on, on the values of life. And it's so strange that in, that very, in those moments of reflection that I find myself saying, well, what am I stuck in that crazy operatic business for? Because the real essences of life are back here. Many people ask me how I ever became an opera singer coming from Saskatchewan. A school teacher's son in a small city, Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, a man who loved the country and a farm. I don't really, don't really know how to answer the question. I'm not going to attempt to. But I do know that here in this wonderful old city of Montreal, uh, I came into contact with one of the very strong and important influences in my life. First of all, I won the competition on the French Canadian Network, the wonderful prize for the uh, winning of Nova Chose Etoile. It gave me a great deal of experience in as much as part of the prize for that contract was a 26, 26 week contract to sing every week with that same organization every Sunday night. And the experience of having to, to deliver the goods every Sunday night was very good for me and very, very good training. I always enjoy returning to Montreal. This time, it is to sing Othello with L'Opéra du Québec. Clarisse Carson sings the role of Othello's wife, Desdemona. It's extremely important as the drama unfolds that every aspect of it be true to the characters involved. That is what Peter Potter as director, Sigmund Nimsgen as Iago, and I are trying to work out here. <laughs> Iago, step by step, pushes Othello towards such a state of jealousy that his murder of Desdemona at the end of the opera is the only possible outcome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Maria! Oh, yeah. Yeah, and this he needs to be very close by. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Then, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, are you going then to move away from him? Miseria mia! Nothing to do, you stay still until then. Let him do all the... I think so. Jealousy. I think so. Yeah, okay. Huh? Fine. But no, whatever no, you wish, no, Peter. No, huh? no, no. Huh? That it should all be reflected in his... Yes, yes, yes. yes sudden fine. soup. Arrogance, yeah. you know, that's yeah, no, yeah. I'm above jealousy, yeah, yeah. And, which is all that nonsense. Fine. Huh? Yes. No? Yes. <laughs> I have my head so. Yeah. And, and then yeah. I turn my face right away from yeah. him so, so that you have to come around. Your turn draws you around. Yes. Good. Okay. Yeah, fine. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, Sigmund, that, that move, do it in qu quickly. It's yeah. marvelous. Then it, it goes absolutely with the. Peter, yeah. I have yes. always liked, I don't know if it's possible, when. I believe, John cannot do anything on the stage unless he absolutely believes in it. What he does must be truthful. And if you ask him to do something which uh, is simply effective, he won't do it. Yes, yeah. This, yeah. You know, he can't do it because it's yeah. not yeah. telling the truth about the character that he's singing. Yes. 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 Oh, Otello, yeah. Yeah. That he pulls yeah. back yeah. a little bit in his... Mm. Smarminess. Yes, <laughs> yes. That's a word we can't translate. No, no, no. Which the Enzi was his smarminess. Smarminess is, mm. you know, Ooh, uh, chocolate uh, sauce. Yeah, 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 Non sfuggir, non sfuggir, una te giova, non sei cura, non mi si, mi prova, basta, 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 but his, uh, his reasons for being difficult are, uh, are right. John is a perfectionist. He wants, he drives himself, and therefore he drives his colleagues. Uh, he demands the best out of him, out of himself. He demands the best out of everyone around him. So I throw you early so that you have time to recover before you have to sing yeah, yeah. Divina Grazia, defend me. Eh? Yes. Does your non say can we do it from there? After double Q. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six after double Q. Does your non say you? Does your non say you? Let me just do that once. The two parts. Yeah, that was fine. That was right. No, no. Once without you. I just want to do this thing. Not the bar afterwards. Take four. <laughs> now that ace is coming late, you see. Take four. Done, done. <laughs> oh, that's right. Okay. Now. Passio. Passio non se più abitato.
There are many operatic artists who uh, do not do their own makeup. I like to do my own. The reason being that I feel that my performance begins the moment I sit down in front of this makeup table. And um, there are two reasons why I do it. I do it because I feel it's an integral part of, of the interpretation of the part. And also I believe that as I put this makeup on, I start to put on also the character of Othello. Uh, there, is a, there is a physical change that I have to make take place in my, in my physiognomy. And there is a, a mental change that I must make in my mind about the, in, in approaching work. too light. The color is way too light. However, I use it as a base all over until I get an evenness of color. Now that we've reached this sort of juncture with my makeup, I think it's time to talk about the, the way that a person develops a character, interprets a character. And uh, in my case, I cannot separate the interpretation of a role from a fundamental belief I have about humanity. And that is that I do believe that inherent in every single solitary human being, there is uh, every capacity for good and every capacity for evil, in different portions, of course. And I think the thing that makes one individual different from another is the balance of the facets of personality. When I study a role, I decide which are the predominant facets of personality that suit the personality that I am supposed to portray. This is, mind you, at the very beginning of my study of the role. And then, having decided what those facets of personality are, I seek to find them in myself. And as I work out the role, decide where I have to exaggerate that particular facet of personality to make Otello. And when I have com completed the study of a role, I then go on the stage, not to sort of, from the outside, put on a character, but on the contrary, that it is motivated from within the facets of personality that I possess myself, which I have consciously distorted, so that I become Motello. <laughs> There are many aspects of this kind of makeup, of course, which would not be acceptable on the, on the television screen or on the movie screen. But we are here working on a makeup for a stage presentation, and so that fundamentally I am thinking now in terms of the stage rather than in terms of, of, the, of the film media. When a person gets to this sort of stage of, of preparation for the stage, for the actual performance, one tends to forget all about now the interpretation of the role and concentrate really on how one is going to calculate the performance vocally. Uh, because every, every single performance is different from every other performance, insofar as you never really feel the same twice. And, uh, and so one primer, at this, at this juncture, one concentrates on uh, how am I going to do the show, and how am I going to do it vocally. And uh, because uh, when all is said and done, and 
as much emphasis as I do put on the interpretive work. If the voice does not serve the dramatic impact of the work, when I finally get out there to present my interpretation, then no one will accept my interpretation. The voice simply has to respond. It is an absolute fundamental. If my voice does not work in this circumstance, then I cannot communicate with my audience and, and portray for them the character of Otello. And so that is the last thing I think about before I put this, present myself to the public.